Thank you. Hear the word of the Lord. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth should change and though the mountains slip into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains quake at its swelling pride, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy dwelling places of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She will, be, she will not be moved. Now, thus says the Lord, your creator, O Jacob, and he who formed you, O Israel. Do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they will not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be scorched, nor will the flame burn you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. A good Lord's Day morning to all of you. Uh, we're thankful this morning, uh, really, for many things, but I must say today we're thankful for the wonders of modern technology, which uh, allow all of us beleaguered, uh, cabin-fevered members of the body of Christ to enjoy the ministry of the Word of God this morning. Uh, if we have visitors tuning in with us for the first time this morning, we especially welcome you and trust you'll be blessed uh, by hearing the scriptures read and this message that Dan has prepared, uh, proclaimed. And when things return to normal, we invite you to come and join us in person. We're missing that personal connection, aren't we? Uh, that's something that's vital uh, for community. Uh, 40, 50 years ago, we used to call that body life. And uh, so we've, we've lost that connection, but we want you to know that we understand the importance of the members of the body of Christ having venues available to avoid the kind of social isolation that some of us are feeling today. Many of you are enduring uh, difficult life trials. You've uh, lost family members. Uh, you're enduring uh, difficult uh, illnesses, financial challenges, perhaps even uh, just loneliness. <clears throat> so we have some initiatives underway. I want you to know that. Uh, that will help bridge that isolation and en enable us to continue with the ministries that have been ongoing, such as uh, the Bible studies, the prayer uh, ministries. But also, you may just miss uh, the personal interaction that we have with one another, uh, with fellow members. So we want you to encourage you to use your phones, uh, not just to text, uh, not just to uh, browse the internet, but to actually call uh, one another and, and have a conversation with each other. You've been doing that, I know, uh, but let me add that if you would like to request that someone from the church give you a call, uh, please contact the church office or call me and, and let us know and someone uh, will reach out to you. The Lord bless you all. Uh, let's remember to pray for one another. Uh, uh, the prayer requests are in the bulletin that was sent out uh, via email, and so uh, please note those, those prayer requests and others that you know individually. So let's remember to pray for one another, to help one another, uh, to trust in a faithful uh, Lord, to strengthen us, uh, to cope with this unusual situation that we find ourselves in. And now open your hearts uh, to hear the ministry of the word as Dan comes forward to read our scripture passage for this morning. Thank you, Mark, and good morning. These are strange times we're living in. As I look out on an almost empty audience, I'm reminded of that, but... Thank you for those good words, Mark. What I can say is the Lord is on his throne. And this is the day that he's made. And so while I don't know and you don't know when this is going to end and how it's going to end, we know this. It will end. And for God's people, it will end well. We have that confidence from the word of God. 
And so we can trust him in the midst of it. And the passage that we will look at this morning, 1 Kings chapter 21, is a passage that I did not choose for this particular day or occasion, but as I read it and reflect upon it, I think it's an excellent passage for this day and time. It speaks to the very things that I've just said, that the Lord God, in the midst of difficulty, is on His throne and working things out according to His will and for the good of His people. It's a passage that we have, uh, that is in our series on the life and times of Elijah the prophet. We have been out of that for, what, three weeks now? And so if you remember, the last event in Elijah's life was his flight from Jezebel and her threat to make him like he made the prophets of Baal. He had killed them after his uh, great triumphant display on the Mount uh, of uh, Carmel where he had challenged the prophets of Baal and God had brought down fire to consume the altar. But thinking that perhaps revival would occur in the palace, he found just the opposite and she threatened his life and he fled and ran all the way down to Mount Horeb, which is Mount Sinai. Well, that was chapter 19. Chapter 20 is a chapter that does not include Elijah. He's absent from that. Ahab is fighting the Assyrians and wins a great battle and has great confidence in where he is. And yet he has a prophet that tells him things will not work so well for him after all. Nevertheless, we pick up with the passage in chapter 21 where Elijah again appears Now it came about after these things that Naboth the Jezreelite had a vineyard which was in Jezreel beside the palace of Ahab, king of Samaria. Ahab spoke to Naboth saying, Give me your vineyard that I may have it for a vegetable garden because it is close beside my house and I will give you a better vineyard than it in its place. If you like, I will give you the price of it in money. But Naboth said to Ahab, The Lord forbid me that I should give you the inheritance of my fathers. So Ahab came into his house sullen and vexed because of the word which Naboth the Jezreelite had spoken to him. For he said, I will not give you the inheritance of my fathers. And he lay down on his bed and turned away his face and ate no food. But Jezebel, his wife, came to him and said to him, How is it that your spirit is so sullen and that you are not eating food? So he said to her, Because I spoke to Naboth the Jezreelite and said to him, Give me your vineyard for money or else if it pleases you, I will give you a vineyard in its place. But he said, I will not give you my vineyard. Jezebel, his wife, said to him, Do you now reign over Israel? Arise, eat bread, and let your heart be joyful. I will give you the vineyard of Naboth Naboth the Jezreelite. So she wrote letters in Ahab's name and sealed them with his seal and sent letters to the elders and to the nobles who were living with Naboth in his city. Now she wrote in the letters saying, Proclaim a fast, and seat Naboth at the head of the people, and seat two worthless men before him, and let them testify against him, saying, You cursed God and the king. Then take him out and stone him to death. So the men of his city, the elders and the nobles who lived in his city, did as Jezebel had sent word to them, just as it was written in the letters which she had sent them. They proclaimed a fast and seated Naboth at the head of the people. Then the two worthless men came in and sat before him, and the worthless men testified against him, even against Naboth before the people, saying, Naboth cursed God and the king. 
So they took him outside the city and stoned him to death with stones. Then they sent word to Jezebel saying, Naboth has been stoned and is dead. When Jezebel heard that Naboth had been stoned and was dead, Jezebel said to Ahab, Arise, take possession of the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite, which he refused to give you for money. For Naboth is not alive, but dead. When Ahab heard that Naboth was dead, Ahab arose to go down to the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite to take possession of it. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, saying, Arise, go down to meet Ahab, king of Israel, who is in Samaria. Behold, he is in the vineyard of Naboth, where he has gone down to take possession of it. You shall speak to him, saying, Thus says the Lord, Have you murdered and also taken possession? And you shall speak to him, saying, Thus says the Lord, in the place where the dogs licked up the blood of Naboth, the dogs will lick up your blood, even yours. Ahab said to Elijah, Have you found me, O my enemy? And he answered, I have found you, because you have sold yourself to do evil in the sight of the Lord. Behold, I will bring evil upon you and will utterly sweep you away, and will cut off from Ahab every male, both bond and free in Israel. And I will make your house like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Naboth, and like the house of Baasha, the son of Ahijah, because of the provocation with which you provoked me to anger, and because you have made Israel sin. Of Jezebel also, has the Lord spoken, saying, The dogs will eat Jezebel in the district of Jezreel. May the Lord bless this reading of His Word and bless our time of studying it together. Let's bow together in a word of prayer. Father, we thank You for Your goodness to us. We thank you that you see everything that's happening in the world around us and your eye is upon your people personally, individually, and you're guiding us with your providential hand and we're to know that, we're to see that truth in the passage that we have read, which is a tragic passage, and yet in the midst of it we can find great reason for rejoicing and grace and your grace in it. And I pray that you would help us to do that. Help us to understand the things that we have read and how they apply to us and how they unfold your greatness and glory that should be an encouragement to us and in fact is the ground and the basis for any encouragement that we have. And we have reason for encouragement every moment at this time is in the same as it would be if there were no problems around us at all. Because you're in control. As I said earlier, you're on your throne. And we're to know that. We're to rest in that. So encourage your people. Bless them. As we study this together, bless each of us and build us up in the faith. And help us to get a glimpse of your greatness and glory and how it applies to us at this present time. We pray that for those who may be in difficulty. We pray for those who may be sick. We pray that uh, you would encourage them and give them the confidence they should have. We live and we move and we exist in you, as Paul told the, the uh, Athenian philosophers in Acts 17. You're never away from us, and we can never be away from you. And uh, we need to know that and reckon that to be true and live in light of it. These days, Father, are times of anxiety, and yet they're an occasion for your church to be a light. I pray that we'll be that, that each one of us will be a light to those we come in contact with, and that we would show the confidence that we should have in the midst of difficulty. But some are going through difficulty, and we pray for them. We pray for the sick. Pray for those that are anxious, 
Lord, may we not be anxious. We pray that you would guide us and calm us and bless us. Pray that you would bless us now as we continue with this text of Scripture and our study in it. Bless us and then bless us as we conclude this service. We thank you for Christ. We thank you for all that we have in him. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. William Shakespeare wrote a play titled All's Well That Ends Well. It's not a Christian play, but the title applies to Christians universally, even when things seem not to end well. And often they don't. The saints suffer the same afflictions as the world, rebellious children, financial setbacks, dementia, protracted, difficult deaths, unjust deaths when they suffer for the faith. The world has a cynical way of dealing with that kind of thing, with statements like, life's not fair. In other words, don't be naive. Get used to it. And that's true. It's not fair. It's a fallen world we live in. Still, even when we know the nature of things, we are often troubled when bad things happen to good people. When God's saints suffer, and we may wonder why, and wonder where was God? Some of those 7,000 saints in Israel who had not bowed to Baal might have wondered that when godly Naboth, one of them, was set up, falsely accused, and murdered so that the king could have his plot of land. It's one of the most shocking stories in the Bible and one that influenced Nathaniel Hawthorne's classic, The House of the Seven Gables, a novel about a land grab and the curse on the guilty man's family. Now that's fiction and romance. First Kings 21 is not fiction or romance, it's history and brutal history. But it gives more than a forewarning that life's not fair. It also reveals that God sees and judges. So King Ahab learned Proverbs 14. There is a way which seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. Though at the time everything seemed right for Ahab to do as he pleased. Elijah had been missing from the story since fleeing Jezebel and meeting God on Mount Horeb in chapter 19. In the meantime, life has gone on in Israel and gone rather well for the royal couple. Ahab won a big victory over Ben-Hadad and the Syrian army in chapter 20. Jezebel's prophets had recovered from the calamity on Mount Carmel. And Baal worship was still the state religion. Things were back to normal. There was peace and prosperity in the land. The three-year drought was over and forgotten. It was time for life and a life of leisure. So Ahab took up gardening. He was excited about his hobby. One day he was puttering around the palace and he noticed a vineyard next door and thought that would be perfect for growing vegetables and so convenient. So he decided to buy it or make a trade for it. He contacted the owner, Naboth, and made an offer. Give me your vineyard that I may have it for a vegetable garden because it is close beside my house and I will give you a better vineyard than it in its place. If you like, I will give you the price of it in money. Naboth had no interest in trading or selling his vineyard for any price. Verse 3, but Naboth said to Ahab, The Lord forbid me that I should give you the inheritance of my fathers. The Lord forbid because the law forbid such a sale. In Leviticus 25, verse 23, it is stated, The land, moreover, shall not be sold permanently. 
That's the reason Naboth refused to sell the land. It wasn't because he had a preference for his vineyard or because the vineyard was beautiful to him or because of its productivity. There's nothing said of that. Ahab wanted it because of its location. It was near to his palace and convenient for his use. It allowed him to expand his gardens. And because of that, he was glad to make Naboth a deal and make a good deal. He offered him a better vineyard in its place. So Naboth likely stood to make a nice profit off the sale or trade up for an even better vineyard, but he refused. Not for personal reasons, but for spiritual reasons. This was his God-given inheritance, which he was required to protect and to pass on to the next generation according to the law. Selling it would violate God's command. That's the reason for Naboth's resolute response, the Lord forbid me that I should give you the inheritance of my fathers. Naboth was obedient. He faced the same kind of temptation that we all face, the temptation to improve our situation either financially or socially, but doing it by ignoring the clear instruction of Scripture or violating one's convictions. Then for Naboth, there was the the danger of offending the king, a man of power. No one wants to do that. People want to to please the powerful and not upset them. After all, it was a generous offer that he had made. This, This is when it's very easy to rationalize things. When when we stand to profit from a deal or to please a person of influence, after all, you know, we can always use a little more money and it never hurts to please the king. But it seems Naboth didn't give any thought to any of that. The temptation was there, but he wasn't phased by it because Naboth was more concerned about obedience to God than he was in any kind of personal gain. So he easily passed up the prophet, even at the peril of offending the powerful, because Naboth was a righteous man. Ahab was not used to dealing with a man like that, at least not since Elijah left. But it was a teachable moment. The the lesson there was there, and that lesson was very simply that there are things that are more important than things, than gardens or money or approval, and that's serving God and walking with the Lord. But Ahab wasn't teachable. Naboth's righteousness made no impression on him, at least no positive impression. It meant nothing to him. He only wanted that piece of land. This is an example of what Paul meant when he wrote in Colossians chapter 3, verse 5, that greed is idolatry. Ahab's garden was his idol, one of his many idols. And idolatry corrupts the soul. The, the God that we have in our mind affects the way we think and the way we live. And an idol is false, and it's corrupting. He went home, went to bed, and sulked. When his servants brought his meal, he turned his face to the wall and refused to eat. He was so unhappy. This was a grown man acting like a spoiled child. He was king of Israel, rich and powerful. He wasn't used to anyone dealing with him in this way, telling him no. When it happened, he didn't know how to deal with disappointment. It's a a dangerous thing for a person to get everything he or she wants in life. Ahab was unprepared for letdowns in life. So he sulked. 
This is what becomes of a man who lives only for the world, for the material, for the earthly, and starves himself of the spiritual, of God's Word, of the Scriptures. His soul dries up. He has no wisdom or maturity. So Solomon wrote in Proverbs 1 of wisdom, shouting in the street and in the square, saying, How long, O naive ones, will you love being simple-minded? So wisdom invites young people to follow her and promises to pour out her spirit on them. But people love to follow their own desires. Ahab refused to follow wisdom and grew up to be a childish fool and a very weak man. But he was an Israelite and would have had some familiarity with the law of Moses, which instructed the king in Deuteronomy chapter 17 and verse 20, not to lift himself up over his countrymen. He was under the law the same as they were. Maybe, maybe that restrained Ahab from acting like a tyrant and simply confiscating Naboth's property. If so, his wife had no such scruples. When she learned that he was not eating, she became alarmed and went to check on him and asked him what was wrong. And so King Ahab sat up, wiped his eyes of its tears, and uh, tells him his sad, sad story. Verse 6, he said to her, Because I spoke to Naboth the Jezreelite and said to him, Give me your vineyard for money, or else if it pleases you, I will give you a vineyard in its place. But he said, I will not give you my vineyard. Now, if Jezebel had any sympathy for Ahab, it seems to evaporate. She says, do you now reign over Israel? Meaning, who is the king here? You or Naboth? Act like a king. She was no Israelite. She had no interest in or respect for the book of Deuteronomy and the law of God. She was a Phoenician princess. She knew how Phoenician rulers governed as despots with absolute authority. They bent the will of the people to their own will and took what they wanted. Ahab, she thought, was being a weakling. But she knew what to do. Arise, eat bread, and let your heart be joyful. I will give you the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite. And with that, she stepped into Ahab's shoes and played the part of the king and plotted murder. Verse 8, so she wrote letters in Ahab's name and sealed them with his seal and sent the letters to the elders and to the nobles who were living with Naboth in his city. Now she wrote in the letter saying, Proclaim a fast, and seat Naboth at the head of the people, and seat two worthless men before him, and let them testify against him, saying, You curse God and the king. Then take him out and stone him to death. This was a cold and evil woman, a real pagan. She had absolutely no fear of God And she felt completely safe and secure. Whatever happened on Mount Carmel in chapter 18 was ancient history. She had scared away Yahweh's prophet. He was gone. The Lord was irrelevant. She was queen of Israel and Baal was God. Besides, she acted in secret. No one would know. She was confident she was safe. It was Jezebel's plan, but Ahab was complicit in it. He knew what was happening, but didn't have the courage or the will or the desire to stop it. He allowed her to use his seal and send the letters. So having enlisted her fellow conspirators, they carried out her scheme and 
wasted no time in doing it, which shows not only their moral corruption, but their fear of crossing the queen. She was not one to be crossed. And that only highlights the integrity and the godliness of Naboth. He was equally quick in refusing the king when the king was violating God's law. Naboth feared God, not man. So they called a fast. The reason for it isn't given, but it was to prevent some catastrophe from occurring, maybe another great drought or a national crisis like a war with the Syrians. That would be the purpose for the feast. The people humbled themselves before the Lord because they assumed someone had sinned and that would be the cause of catastrophe, sin, rebellion, which is the very thing Naboth would be accused of committing. He was seated in front of everyone. Then two worthless men, literally sons of Belial, that's what they're called, that's what's in the original text, which means sons of worthlessness, sat in front of him. Two men, the city leaders, trusted to lie. And true to plan, they accused Naboth of blaspheming God and the king, and the significance of blaspheming the king is the king is the representative of God. To blaspheme him is to blaspheme God. It had the appearance of being legal. Blasphemy was punishable by death, which required two or more witnesses. The, the two men lied. Naboth was convicted, and the people stoned him. When Jezebel got the news, she triumphantly commanded Ahab to Go get this vineyard. Arise, she said. Take possession of the vineyard, for Naboth is not alive but dead. What Jezebel didn't know is that when she tells Ahab to arise, God told Elijah to arise. Go down to meet Ahab. He is in the vineyard of Naboth. He sent him off with a message for the king, a blood-curdling message of doom for both him and Jezebel. So when Ahab went to the vineyard and began to walk among the vines and grapes and think of the garden that he would plant, suddenly, standing before him was Elijah. It stopped Ahab cold. He had no thought of seeing the prophet again. He thought he was rid of him for good. And there he was, again, dressed in his hair coat and leather belt, looking fierce. Seeing him, Ahab said, Have you found me, O my enemy? His words betray a sense of guilt. He's been found as though he had been in hiding, as though he were a fugitive. And he had been found because he had been found out. And then Ahab was a fool again. We see that here because he thought that he could commit this crime without being found out and brought to justice. God is omnipresent. He's omniscient. He is everywhere and he knows everything. Proverbs 15 verse 3, the eyes of the Lord are in every place watching the evil and the good. Watching both Ahab and Jezebel, watching Naboth. And Ahab didn't care about the Proverbs, as we know. He didn't care about wisdom. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. That was Ahab. He despised the very thing he needed most, wisdom. And fundamental to wisdom and knowledge and the good life is the fear of the Lord. The basis of folly, then, is denying the Lord. 
That's Psalm 14. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Now that's not only an indictment on atheism, theoretical atheism, the belief that there is no God, that the world is strictly material, there's no spiritual, there's no creator, but it is also an indictment on practical atheism, which is far more common. And what practical atheism is, is not denying the existence of God, but simply living and thinking as though there is no God. That was both Ahab and Jezebel, two very religious people. But they gave no thought to God, the only God, the Lord God. They dismissed him as irrelevant. His prophet was long gone. And besides, Jezebel thought, I'm doing everything in secret. Now suddenly, his prophet is back staring down Ahab with what Alfred Edersheim called his burning eyes and exposing Ahab's secret sins of murder and theft. That's what Elijah does. Have you found me, O my enemy? To which Elijah answers, I have found you. In other words, yes, I am your enemy because you have sold yourself to do evil in the sight of the Lord. That accusation against Ahab is vivid and forceful. You have sold yourself to do evil. The word is used of people selling themselves into slavery. It is a conscious, deliberate act. Ahab couldn't blame his wife like Adam did. He wasn't sold. He sold himself. He willingly put himself under evil's control. That's what the fool does. And in doing that, he becomes a slave to sin. So in that incisive statement, Elijah pronounces Ahab guilty. Then he pronounced sentence. Because he had sold himself to do evil, God said in verse 19, dogs would lick up his blood. In verse 21, he said, Behold, I will bring evil upon you and will utterly sweep away, sweep you away, and will cut off from Ahab every male, both bond and free in Israel. And I will make your house like the house of Jeroboam, the, Nab of the son of Nabot, and like the house of Baasha, the son of Ahijah, because of the provocation with which you have provoked me to anger. And because you have made Israel sin. Of Jezebel also he has, also has the Lord spoken saying, the dogs will eat Jezebel in the district of Jezreel. Jezebel met her end when she was thrown out of a window and hit the pavement like a watermelon. And the dogs ate her remains. C.F. Kyle, the German commentator, called it the most ignominious end. It was that. No one escapes God's justice. And for Ahab, it was completely deserved. The historian comments on him in verse 25 and verse 26 to say that he was the worst of all the 20 kings of Israel. Surely there was no one like Ahab who sold himself to do evil in the sight of the Lord because Jezebel, his wife, incited him. Listen, young people. It matters who you marry. Ahab was influenced by his wife. Ahab was still guilty. Yet surprisingly, he responded to the words of the prophet. Verse 27, it came about when Ahab heard these words that he tore his clothes and put on sackcloth and fasted. And he lay in sackcloth and went about despondently. And God noticed Ahab's response, noticed his contrition. And he told Elijah that because Ahab had humbled himself, he would delay the judgment. Now, that's the mercy of God. Ahab's response was right and good as far as it went. 
didn't go far enough. It was not repentance unto salvation, but it was genuine contrition, sorrow for sin, and certainly sorrow for the judgment pronounced. And the Lord answered with mercy, which shows again His character that He is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth. Still, it was temporary. Justice delayed is not always justice denied. And Ahab met his end in the next chapter in a clearly divine way. He went to war against the Syrians again, and to ensure his safety, he disguised himself as a common soldier. Corporal Ahab reporting for duty. But 1 Kings 22 verse 34 states, Now a certain man drew his bow at random and struck the king of Israel in a joint of the armor. It took him out of the battle and he died that evening. Bad luck? No. That's the providence of God. An arrow shot at random from human, the human perspective was the providence of God and it meeting its mark in that one place, the joint of his armor. Shows exactly that this is the work of the Lord God. And when they washed the, the chariot in Samaria, the, we read that the dogs licked up his blood, a prophecy fulfilled. We cannot hide from the Lord, and we cannot thwart His will. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, watching the evil and the good. That's the great lesson of this passage. The judge of all all the earth sees, and He does rightly. He does righteously. He saw Jezebel and Ahab. He dealt with them. But He also saw the good... He saw Naboth, a a faithful man, a righteous man. So what happened? Why didn't God protect him? We might have understood it if Naboth, Naboth had been an obstinate or hostile man toward Ahab, if he had treated the king with disrespect, but he didn't do any of that. He acted righteously. In fact, No doubt that is what galled Ahab and Jezebel, Naboth's obedience, and denying him what he wanted for righteousness' sake. It convicted and incensed them. But for that very reason, wouldn't we expect the Lord to intervene on Naboth's behalf? Instead, Naboth was allowed to suffer injustice at the hand of Jezebel, He obeyed the Lord and trusted the Lord. So the question is asked, why didn't God rescue innocent Naboth, who was his faithful servant and child and who was brought into danger by his faith and obedience? It's the question that Job had all through his grief and sickness. It's what philosophers and theologians wrestle with. The problem of evil. Why do bad things happen to good people? Why do God's people, why do good Christians get the plague? The Spanish flu? Coronavirus? We'll only find the answer to that in the Bible. It is not because God is evil. He is not. It's not because God is helpless. He is not. He is the almighty, all-knowing God. He is righteous and holy and good. He hates evil. That's where we begin. We must begin with the fear of the Lord. It is the beginning of knowledge and wisdom. And we think from that basis. And we apply things from that basis. And based on that, we walk by faith. Trusting that his plan is perfect and what may seem to contradict his will really doesn't. And what may appear foolish is really wise. In fact, we know from 
such passages as Romans 8, from such passages as Romans 8, 28, that he only allows the world to harm us and the devil to touch us if it is for our good and for his glory and the good of his church. We may not know how harm or setbacks are good for us or or why they happen, but we know by faith, and I, I underline that, we know by faith that they are ultimately for our good. Maybe Naboth's martyrdom was used by God to open the eyes of Israelites to the evilness of Baalism and to bring them to faith. As Tertullian said, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. Ultimately, Scripture refers us to heaven and the world to come. That is where the answers will be given when it is stated in the book of Revelation, God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Everything will be resolved. Everything will be understood. Ultimately, that's the hope we have, the confidence we can have. In the meantime, we're to be faithful to the Lord, as Naboth was. Trust the Lord in spite of the circumstances and know that He is good for His Word and will always lead us in the right way and the best path. He promises to be with us through fire and water and bless our obedience at every step. But that does not mean that we won't have hardship. In fact, Jesus said, in the world you have tribulation. He told that to His disciples. He tells that to us as well. Paul said the same in Acts 14. After being stoned and left for dead, he told the young believers in Lystra not to be surprised. Through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. What happened to Naboth is a reminder of that. We should not be naive about the promises of God and our life in this world. We are in a battle, a spiritual battle, an invisible war with evil men and spirits that hate righteousness. But again, God lets nothing touch us that will not be for our good. And He will bless us for our faith and obedience. He turns injustice and what appears to be defeat into victory. There's no greater proof of that than Christ and the cross. Jesus, too, had an unfair trial. Like Naboth, he was accused of blasphemy. When he was brought before Pilate, he was charged with treason, acting against the king. He had false witnesses, worthless men who lied about him. And he was put to death even though he was innocent. The only truly innocent man to ever live. The only truly good man to ever live. When it happened, his disciples were completely defeated. They fled and they went into hiding. But his death was actually his greatest victory. At the cross, Christ purchased his people and delivered them from the power and penalty of sin and the devil. It was the reason he came into this world in the first place. The cross then was his great victory. And the resurrection was the Father's proof that He had accepted His Son's sacrifice for us. And it's the guarantee that we too will overcome the grave and rise to a new life in a new and glorious world. The bloody end of Naboth also has a glorious end. It's not given here in the chapter, but I, I share the opinion of F.W. Krumacher, who wrote, we may well be quite sure that <clears throat> it was with no discontent or complaint against divine providence that Naboth, just after he had closed his eyes upon this world amid volleys of stones, opened them before the throne of God. I believe that. What did Shakespeare say? All's well that ends well. And this is where it ends for all who have believed in Jesus Christ and rest 
in his sacrifice for them before the throne of God. In the end, we win. It will not end well for the unbeliever. Justice will come to all just as it did to Ahab and Jezebel. He knows all. The eyes of the Lord are in every place watching the evil and the good. And the evil must answer to the judge of all the earth someday. That's Christ. When the Apostle John saw him on the Isle of Patmos, he said in Revelation 1 verse 14, his eyes were like a flame of fire. No one wants to face those penetrating, all-seeing, all-knowing, flaming eyes of justice and the fires that follow. And there is a way of escape. God has provided that for all who believe. It's the cross. It is faith in Christ and God's eternal Son, the second person of the Trinity, who became a real man in order to stand in our place under God's judgment. He took our penalty and bore our sins away. And everyone who joins himself or herself to him through faith receives forgiveness and life everlasting. God is just. He is also merciful. Believe in His Son and be saved. May God help you to do that if you have not. And may God encourage you with the great truth that He sees, He knows, He acts, and He's acting on your behalf. And He will take care of each and every one of you who have put your faith in Him. I'm going to close now with prayer, and then the service will end with another hymn. Let's bow in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for your goodness to us, and we come to a passage like this, which is not a pleasant passage. It's a passage of sin and treachery and judgment, but also one of faithfulness. And it gives us a real look at reality and the way things are for us and the difficulties that we may face, but also with the great truth that you are on your throne, you see all, you know all, and you act, and you act in our behalf. And while things may be bad to the very end and may not end well as we would hope them to, they do end well in eternity. And so, Father, we thank you that you are in control of our lives, that we live and move and we exist in you. And so encourage us, Father, and uh, enable us not to be fearful in these times, but to be bold and be lights in the midst of darkness. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.